Uh, welcome to this sort of mini lecture. I first want to acknowledge the co-authors who have helped with this research. These are my disclosures. So, yeah, my background is AI and I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm sorry if any of this is basic to you. Um, but ultrasound is really good for imaging the pelvic floor in three dimensions and in real time. The probes are accessible, available, however, there are drawbacks. The imaging and acquisition quality is really operator dependent. And in order to get clinical diagnosis information, we need to perform like manual medical imaging analysis tasks which are performed on dedicated ultrasound software. An example of this is the um, protocol by Dietz to measure the levator hiatus um, area, which is used to um, indicate pelvic organ prolapse. The issue with manual analysis is that it's time consuming, it's prone to inter-observer error and human error, and it requires not only a high level of skill um, for the acquisition, it's also dependent on the analysis. So there's a transformative like, technology called artificial intelligence, and it's been shown to automate medical imaging analysis tasks really well. AI can save time, reduce error, and standardize the tasks, and it can also lower the entry level or skill for clinicians to perform these tasks. AI has issues like anything, and there's medical liability issues that are at stake. And this means that the algorithm might end up over-diagnosing or under-diagnosing conditions. So when you create your AI algorithm, it's really important that you not only perform well, but that also you have a tool to allow a clinician to make edits if necessary. An example of the first convolutional neural network is a type of architecture or algorithm that we use in the pelvic floor domain is shown below from Esther Bonmati and it segments the levator hiatus automatically from a plane of minimal height or dimensions. The blue is the algorithm and the red is the user. So you can see visually they're quite similar. I'm now going to give a very brief introduction. You could, yeah, spend months reading books if you're interested. <laughs> so I'll try my best to summarize in a minute or two. Um, but AI is any program that can perform a task that's usually associated with human intelligence. There's a subset of AI called machine learning, and this is when, sorry, it's smaller than I thought it would be, um, but it's when the algorithm will learn from data over time. And then, oh, my bad, um, go back on the red but yeah and then deep learning is a subset of machine learning again this is awful to see but it's a neural network approach it's based on the human cortex of the brain and it learns from a vast amount of data so what deep learning is deep learning is really the state of the art algorithm and within deep learning the algorithm the convolutional neural network is really state of the art and how this algorithm learns is we have a input image, a training image. This is object detection. So imagine it's something that you see in clinic. It goes forward through these layers, which are mathematical operations. And at the output, you get a probability map of what the algorithm thinks you're trying to teach it. You compare that probability map to a ground truth label, which is curated by an expert, and you measure the difference between your output of the algorithm and the ground truth. This is what we call a loss, but you can associate it with, with an error of, for example, pixel value or something. This loss is then fed back to the network, and all of these layers will change by a little or by a lot, depending on how big or small your error is. So this process is then repeated for hundreds or thousands of images over time and then the loss starts to go towards zero and you've trained your algorithm. What these layers are is, is quite nice. It's their feature extractors so you can visualize really what they're doing. They're extracting features from your images. At the lower layers, so at the start of the um, diagram, they're low level features, for example, straight lines, edges. In the mid layers, they are more complex. In this case, it's facial detection, so it's eyes, nose, mouth, but pelvic floor, this might be part of the tissue, it might be the anorectum, 
And then the deeper layers are really complex features. So for facial detection, it's faces, but if it was the levetahitis, it could be the levetahavulsion left, at right, ballooning. So you can kind of imagine how it learns. Now I mentioned data and that's because data is extremely important and if you want to do this at home or in your clinic there's some things you need to know. So the data must represent the clinical reality, the acquisition quality, you can't pretend every day you acquire high quality ultrasounds because that's not yeah, true. So you need to make sure your training data has a varied acquisition quality and case mix of pathologies. Um, you also need good quality labels, so for outlining structures, I call this, well in my field we call it segmentations, and they need to be done by highly skilled experts in the field um, because your algorithm is going to learn how to do it. You need to make sure you always test on a different data set because in clinic you're going to give your algorithm new data it's not seen, so you need to gauge how that will perform in clinic. And finally, you need a lot of data. I put 250, but it's hard to judge because it's depend on the task and it can vary by a lot or by a little. Unfortunately, in our domain, there are no public data sets available, so it's very time consuming to acquire this data. And we need to test on at least 100 images probably to show that it's um, clinically useful. I'm now going to talk through some work I've automated during my PhD. And the first one is the extraction of the levetahitis area from a transperineal volume. To do this, we have our volume. It goes into a convolutional neural network called UNET. This is state of the art in my field. So it's not really important but to know, but it will learn this uh, position of the symphys pubis and the levator ani muscle that define the plane of minimal height of dimensions. Catiac to what I just said, needing 250, this was only trained on 25 cases. We then can localize and extract the plane of minimal height of dimensions and feed this into a 2D convolutional neural network that extracts the levetahitis automatically. So we go from something from a volume to the area and that 2D network was trained on 256 images of the hiatus. I have some visual results to show. It's based on the um, Holzdorf distance, which is an evaluation metric. I show the 0 to the 100th percentile result. And the Holzdorf distance is really a measure between the two closest points of one curve to the other and the distance between them. So the bigger the number, the worse it is. And you can see the green line and the green mask are from our expert, and the red line and the red mask are from our algorithm. I think it's safe to say from the 25th result, the position visually of the plane of minimal height dimensions is extremely similar to the expert. The plane is similar and so is the segmentation and area. I've now got two tables to show and there's a lot of numbers, please don't read them all, but the main important thing I want to show you is that the computer observer difference is lower than the inter-observer difference. So by automating this process, we've actually standardized the task of manual height um, outlining and we could potentially increase the amount of clinicians who can perform this task in the clinic. We also dramatically reduce time by um, 120 seconds per volume on average. We follow the clinical workflow, but there are still some medical liability issues. So we try to address this by developing an interactive segmentation pipeline to give the clinician control of the output of the algorithm to use for a diagnosis. So the first section is the same as what I just explained, the automatic segmentation. We then evolve something called an active contour. It's just a contour that changes in time based on the image it's looking at. And this contour can be adapted in our software by the clinician to go from something that's clinically unacceptable to something that's clinically acceptable. I've now got a video to demonstrate this a lot better. I hope, yeah, so this is at Valsalva. The segmentation is really bad um, and the contour evolves to the boundary and then in a few clicks the user can go from something that is not clinically acceptable to something that is. This increases the probability of these kind of tools being implemented in the clinical setting because it gives control back to the clinician for diagnosis. 
We then decided to focus on another structure, the anal sphincter complex. We believe that we kind of finished this, not finished the story, but we extracted the plane, we segmented the hiatus, and we created a tool for um, control. So we wanted to focus on a different part of the pelvic floor, and that being the anal sphincter. And we decided to try and automate the tomographic ultrasound imaging um, sequence extraction from a transperineal volume following the protocol by DEETS, which is then used to measure tears. The pipe pipeline goes as follows. We have our volume. We use a 3D unit trained on 100 external anal sphincter segmentations. We extract the external anal sphincter automatically from the volume. We identify the mid-sagittal plane um, as done in clinic, and we find the center of our um, segmentation. We then extract four planes to compute an average segmentation. This is just to make the method more robust. And then we calculate, yeah, we use principal um, axis rotation to calculate the rotation angle required to horizontalize our external anal sphincter in the mid-sagittal plane. We then identify the two sequence extraction points, the same as the clinician would visually, and we get something that is visually similar to the manual analysis of two extraction. I've now got a few images to show. So this is an example of a best performing result. Um, the top is the algorithm, the bottom is the manual. The main difference is the post-processing algorithm, which we don't have um, access to. And you can see the position of the slices is quite similar. The slices visually are showing the same clinical diagnostic, diagnostic um, information. And it's quite nicely automated what was done manually. We now have a average result. You can see the rotation angle visually is similar. The position of the slices slightly differs. The last slice number eight is on seven or not. Um, as far to the right on the um, mid-sagittal plane. However, they show the same clinical diagnostic information. Finally, it's not right just to show you good cases. This is a fail case, and it's due to incorrect rotation of the um, ultrasound volume. So there's still work to be done on this pipeline, but it was just a proof of concept for a conference um, paper that this could be automated in the future. In total of this pipeline, we achieved a clinical acceptability of around 90%. So 90% of our two sequences were comparable and given the same clinical information to the manual extraction. We dramatically reduced the time, I have to read, um, 53 seconds, and we will extend the study in the future with inter-observer studies and improve the pipeline to get better results. So to conclude, we've developed several pipelines that have automated several ultrasound imaging analysis tasks, the height of segmentation, the medical liability tool, and the extraction of the tomographic sequences from the external anal sphincter. In the future, there is still a lot of work that can be done. As I said, this field of research is not that um, well done yet, or there's not many people doing it. For brain tumors, there's hundreds of thousands of institutes working on that, whereas pelvic floor disorder is not really um, yeah, given as much time or space. So there's a lot of work to be done, not just by our institute, by other institutes around the world. One of them that we want to look at is the detection of anal sphincter tearing. So we will try and create an algorithm that measures the tears in our 2E sequences automatically, again, following the protocol by DEETS. And then potentially we could use this to suggest a grade of anal sphincter injury following the protocol by Sultan. We then want to see if these tools can actually reduce the error and reduce the level of expertise required to perform these tasks in the clinic. So we will try and compare a novice against an expert performing several tasks manually and then automatic with our algorithm, we will compare the metrics and the diagnosis. And what we hope to see is that less experienced clinicians in the future may be able to perform these tasks, which with the whole end game being more patients can be imaged, more clinics can use transperineal or ultrasound imaging or endoanal or whatever you want to work on, but we can increase that workload on this problem. We can image more women and potentially we can help at-risk women rather than the women who are going with symptoms. Finally, I also want to help clinicians acquire good quality ultrasound images. I think this is key to not only automatic analysis, but also manual analysis. An example of this is helping with anal sphincter um, 
imaging and what we can do really easily with the algorithms we've already created is um, extract or locate the external anal sphincter for example and make sure that it's in the center of the ultrasound image of correct size and not including artifacts and this again would increase the use of ultrasound imaging potentially in clinics and the analysis process so yeah that's everything thank you very much for listening hope you've enjoyed